All right, friends, this is Steve, the Rogue Scholar, and we are going to be talking about a very important article penned by Jason Hickel. As you follow me, uh, understand that Jason Hickel is one of the people who I think is a fine mind that we need to be really, really paying a lot of attention to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read his article. I'm going to provide my own MMT informed um, talking points in between, but this is a lengthy article. And uh, I got us started like a few seconds early, um, just hoping to jump some of the lunch traffic to get people in here. Um, but, you know, I want, I want to just say this before I get started. Universal basic services is something very different than universal basic income. I get very frustrated, quite frankly, talking to people that want a universal basic income. And let me just, this is not what this is all about, but I want to explain it so you understand where it comes from. We have a bunch of people that don't really understand a lot of things when it comes to economic impacts of certain decisions, structuring of society, certain ways based on certain factors. They don't understand the economic implications and production implications and quite frankly, the triggers for things like inflation and not just regular inflation, but like seriously, like price gouging and stuff like that. <clears throat> Academics like Isabella Weber um, have gone out of their way talking about how commodities impact inflation, but she's also been uh, focused heavily on corporate price gouging. Corporate price gouging happens when certain signals come from the Fed or from government spending um, that say, hey, the people have more money to spend than we previously thought. We've got to change our ROI, return on investment targets, and then they raise those prices up because they're trying to get a piece of the pie of the new money they think you have. But the problem is they don't realize that most of us have put off so much of the important things we need to have done for maintaining our bodies, maintaining our uh, vehicles, maintaining our homes. Uh, helping ensure our children are taken care of, whatever. All the myriad of things that life presents to us, we've oftentimes put on the back burner and said, I can't afford to do this correctly, so I'm just not going to do it. And the unfortunate thing is, is that when you talk to people about a universal basic income, they don't understand that we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a capitalist society where those types of things are big old neon flashing lights for the capitalist class to say those guys have something we want and that's their spare money and so ultimately you see the worst traits in capitalism come out because even guys <laughs> even folks like milton friedman the ultimate and sig heil reich wing assholes the worst economist society has ever seen Never mind the fact that he's revered by many still to this day. But Milton Friedman said the only thing wrong with capitalism was we need more capitalism. And he even offered up helicopter money basically to make sure that people have more money to spend to keep capitalism growing and growing. It wasn't about making sure people's needs were met. It wasn't about making sure that they had a fairly uh, decent, equitable distribution. It was just, we need capitalism to survive and thrive. Let's dump money on the problem. This is the problem with the UBI crowd. They're economically illiterate. They don't understand that if I have a thousand dollars in my hand and the capitalist class decides that they're going to raise health insurance to a thousand and one dollars, well, you don't have anything but a bunch of digits in your bank account. Okay. We need to provide the goods and services and make them guaranteed, not just cash that the capitalists have already proven time and again. They will adjust their pricing structure and the Fed will adjust interest rates and every other thing about laying people off will commence. I'm not sure they understand these things because it's never about thinking through the problem. It's similar to the state by state healthcare people. They think they have an idea, but they don't think about the downstream implications or the fact that states don't have the ability to create money. So one of the big concerns we have now is how do we present this to people so that they understand what's at stake? And so Jason Hickel's um, great article 
universal public services, the power of decommodifying survival is what we're going to talk about here. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this up now. Um, I, and I really do hope that you guys um, take a chance. I put this link in the, um, um, I put this link inside of the, uh, the narrative. So let's go ahead and read it together and we'll fill in the gaps as we go. So universal, let's put this over here so I can see it better. Universal Public Services, The Power of Decommodifying Survival. And again, this is by Jason Hickel. You can see his jasonhickel.org, his blog, great stuff, all the podcasts he's been on. You can check out his two interviews that he's had on Macro and Cheese where I've talked to him. And believe me, my angle of interview is different than other people's angles of interview. So if you're interested in learning from an MMT perspective, the thoughts and ideas that Jason Hickel presents, by all means, listen to the macro and cheese episodes, but you're going to see something very interesting. And let me go back before I bring this back up. Let me just say one more thing. So going back a few years, when I first stumbled on the Jason Nichols degrowth work, I identified two of his books. One was less is more. Um, and the other one was the divide. And in both of his books, the divide um, in particular, he focuses on a lot of positive money ideas, which just aren't necessarily the sharpest, um, sharpest ideas of monetary understanding you can come to. I'll just leave it at that because I have friends in that camp. Um, but Jason Hickel has now come around to the MMT lens, and it's a beautiful thing to see. And I'm not going to claim any credit for it, although I do believe our talks offline maybe help but he is definitely tied in with people like Fadl and others. Um, so I just think it's really super important that we get on board with Jason Hickel. And that's what we're going to do today. Here we go. So Universal Public Services, The Power of Decommodifying Survival. He published this on April 11th, 2023. One of the central insights emerging from research on degrowth and climate mitigation is that Universal Public Services Notice he didn't say universal basic income. He said universal public services, okay? They are the, the jam. They're the thing. They're the thing that we need, right? Universal public services are crucial to a just and effective transition, okay? Capitalism relies on maintaining an artificial scarcity of essential goods and services like housing, healthcare, transport, et cetera. Through processes of enclosure and commodification, we know that enclosure enables monopolists to raise prices and maximize their profits. Consider the rental market, the U.S. healthcare system, or the British rail system. But it also has another effect. When essential goods are privatized and expensive, people need more income than they would otherwise require to access them. Hmm. Kind of interesting there, isn't it? They're going to need more income than they would otherwise require to access them. I wonder what the UBIers would say to this. Probably not much because they don't think that deeply. To get it, they are compelled to increase their labor in capitalist markets, working to produce new things that may or may not be needed with increased energy use, resource use, and ecological pressure. Simply to add things that are clearly not needed and which are quite literally already here. Take housing, for example. If your rent goes up, you suddenly have to work more to keep the same roof over your head. At an economy-wide level, this dynamic means we need more aggregate production, more growth, in order to meet basic needs. From the perspective of capital, this ensures a steady flow of labor for private firms. It maintains downward pressure on wages to facilitate capital accumulation. For the rest of us, it means needless exploitation, insecurity, and ecological damage. Artificial scarcity also creates growth dependencies because survival is mediated by prices and wages. When productivity improvements and recessions lead to unemployment, people suffer loss of access to essential goods even when the output of those goods is not affected and growth is needed to create new jobs and resolve the social crisis. 
There is a way out of this trap by decommodifying essential goods and services. We can eliminate artificial scarcity and ensure public abundance, delink human well being from growth, and reduce growthist pressures. This approach also has several other direct social and ecological benefits. For one, it can have a strong positive impact on human welfare. We know from empirical studies that public services are a powerful driver of improvements in life expectancy, well-being, and other key social indicators. And he points them up here, here, and here. I'm not going to open them up. You can open them when you read them. Uh, universal services would also end the current cost of living crisis by directly reducing the cost of living. Oh, man, you mean to say if they give me money, the cost of living may go up, but if I provide the services, cost of living goes down? I wonder why the UBI people don't talk about this. Oh, I know, because they recognize the UBI is a trash program. So we also know that countries with decommodified or otherwise universal public services can deliver better social outcomes at any given level of GDP and resource use. And he points out a bunch of options here. Please click on those, read them. Everything he brings is very, very vital. Universal services ensure an efficient conversion of the resources. In other words, hold on, let's stop there. Universal services ensures right off the bat, that they're producing those things in the most efficient way possible. Instead of a million different folks competing over scarce resources, driving up prices, et cetera, they do it with centralized thinking, planning, and ensuring that everyone has their needs taken care of. I love it. It speaks to everything that I care about. Really straightforward. Here we go. Let's get back to it. So. Universal services ensure an efficient conversion of resources and energy into social outcomes. Furthermore, as we see, we will see public control over provisioning systems makes it easier to achieve rapid decarbonization in those sectors. Oh, wait, hold on. Is he trying to suggest we might have a climate crisis all the while too? Huh, something to think about. Anyway. So finally, together with a second key policy, the public job guarantee. Oh, my God. Why is Jason Hickel? Why is Jason Hickel talking about an MMT job guarantee? I don't know. Good stuff, isn't it? I know for those of us who have been fighting this fight for a few minutes that actually took the time to learn about UBIs and crap like that and then realized that it was a voucher program that ultimately leads to inflation and price gouging and worse literally literally subsidizing shit wages by major corporations and uberizing society trash policy folks don't be lazy don't be intellectually lazy don't be intellectually dishonest learn what a job guarantee is and learn what it is not Learn what a UBI does and what it does not do. UBI does not guarantee any of the universal needed services, the basic service. It doesn't provide any of them because there's no guarantee. There's no price controls. There's no wage. uh, There's no, uh, let's say, wage floor because it's not work. It's just cash. There's no production to meet it. And more importantly, because I know folks can't get past the idea that this is make work. It's not make work. Anyone that says that is a liar. They have zero integrity and they haven't thought it through and they should not be listened to because a job guarantee based on the modern monetary theory uh, perspective and what Jason's talking about is either targeting certain things that are not in competition uh, with the private sector, but intended to redefine work. We're not just looking for you to move paper from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. We're looking to regenerate communities, local jobs, local communities serving the local people. Okay. But the reality is it might be something as simple as sitting on the phone with someone in an old age home playing, um, I don't know, maybe playing checkers with them online, maybe uh, listening to them, maybe hanging out with a, 
you know, kids or maybe teach them how to blow up balloon animals. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that it could be anything. It could be a surfer taking water samples, as Bill Mitchell has often talked about. The job guarantee is about redefining what work is. So anytime someone says, oh, it's make work. Oh, you can't force them to do it. Or, oh, it's, you know, wait, that's just, uh, uh. shut them up, shut them down, crush their soul with facts. Don't allow them to ever adult the conversation because they are not. They're short circuiting a process that is extremely vital. Okay. Imagine saying, fuck the going to the concert. All I care about is I've got my ticket. I've got my ticket. What matters is the show. That's what you care about. But these folks are trying to make it out to be that the ticket matters. It's not the ticket. It's the show. Jason Hickel producing. What are we talking about? Universal basic services. Let's go. So finally, together with the second key policy, the public job guarantee, this approach would permanently end economic insecurity and resolve the current contradiction between social and ecological objectives. Right now, it is impossible to take even obvious steps toward climate mitigation, such as scaling down fossil fuel production or other destructive sectors, because people in affected industries would lose access to wages, housing, health care, etc. No one should accept such an outcome. With universal services and emancipatory, emancipatory, folks, emancipatory job guarantee, we can protect against any economic insecurity and guarantee a just transition. There is, look at this, there is no necessary contradiction between ecological and social objectives. The two can and must be pursued together. By universal services here, I mean not only health care and education, but also housing, transit, nutritious food, energy, water, and communications. In other words, a decommodification of the core social sector, the means of everyday survival. And I mean attractive, high-quality, democratically managed, properly, univer properly universal services, not the purposefully shitty last resort systems we see in the U.S. and other neoliberal countries. What does this look like? Folks, look at this. Look at that. I want you to understand something. Every time you talk to a UBI person, those people lie about what the job guarantee is. They lie. Why? See, libertarians have long wanted to do away with the social safety nets, the social fabric. They've long wanted to just give you a, a dividend. Here's a peace dividend. Here's a this dividend. And let you go out there and forage for yourself. But unfortunately, we don't have the power of collective pricing. So we don't come in there as a block and say, we'll pay this lower price. They can raise the price any way they want. Why do you suppose they don't talk about that? I think it's an integrity issue. I used to think it was an ignorance issue, but every time I debate with them and I crush their soul, they resort to silly tropes about forced work and make work. It's a sign of someone that's not a serious person. It's a sign of someone who has an agenda, who doesn't want to do the right thing. They have a goal, and that goal is the wrong thing. And that's what a UBI is. It is the wrong thing. It's a false promise. My days of being sympathetic to the idea have long passed, long passed. So... <laughs> Let's read that again so we have the purpose here. By universal services here, I do not only mean health care and education, but also housing, transit, nutritious food, energy, water, and communications. In other words, a decommodification of the core social sector, the means of everyday survival. And I mean attractive, high-quality, democratically managed properly let's see that democratically managed job guarantee what kind of work might a democratically managed job guarantee produce huh so let's go into what it looks like 
health care and education. This one is common. Most European countries have universal health care and education systems, many of which rank as the best health systems in the world. The key principle is health care should be free at the point of use, ideally through a public provider without the intermediation of expensive private insurers. Similarly, public education should be tuition free from primary school through university. Existing debts accrued for health care and education should be canceled. God, I love this man. Is there not, what's not to love about Jason Hickel? Yes, I'm fanboying. Housing costs constitute a large portion of household expenses. This is an essential good, as necessary as health care and education. Yet people often spend 30 to 50% of their wages on rent for housing that is often woefully substandard. And buying a house is in many places increasingly unaffordable to anyone who isn't rich. It is important to recognize a distinction between owning one's own residence, fine, and private control of rental units. He doesn't say it, but unfine, which is where the problems arise, particularly in the case of large corporate landlords that control dozens or even thousands of homes. The latter represents enclosure of a key resource that is fundamental for survival. We don't tolerate this for health care, but for some reason we regularly do it when it comes to housing. One effective intervention would be to simply limit the number of rental units that any individual or firm can own and require the sale of surplus properties. The influx of housing into the market would drive prices down, making it more affordable for people to buy a residence, but also making it more affordable for city governments to buy units and expand the public housing stock and improve the quality of housing which would be naturally integrated into the fabric of the city. Public rental units can be then, then be available on an affordable basis, and every, any remaining private rental units would need to have rates low enough to compete with the public option. You know, Just like the job guarantee, folks, just like the job guarantee. Public rental units can then be available on, the, on an affordable basis and any remaining private retail rental units would need to have uh, would need to have rates low enough to compete with the public option. Vienna and Singapore offer a model for attractive high quality public housing that is enjoyed by 60 to 80% of the population. And such an approach can be used to achieve rapid efficiency improvements in the housing sector, including insulation, heat pumps, and efficient appliances, thus helping to achieve rapid decarbonization. Transit. Public transit should be available for free or very cheap. Barcelona provides a good example where metro and tram journeys across the city's bright, clean, and efficient system cost only one euro, and e-bikes cost a fraction of that. But nearly 100 cities around the world go further and offer free public transit in places where existing public transit infrastructure is inadequate. It should be developed to the point where people do not need cars on a regular basis. High quality public transit is critical to reducing demand for cars and reducing emissions from transport. Boom. Food. Our food system suffers from several problems. Many people cannot afford or access nutritious food. You notice Jason in all of his writing always adds the word nutritious before food. It used to annoy me because it seemed like counterintuitive because, of course, you want nutritious food. But you already see that school breakfast programs and school lunch programs are oftentimes not given the high quality food it deserves. We need to provide people not grape drank, but real, honest to God, vitamins and minerals and nutritious food, just as Jason says, even in the world's richest nations. Supermarkets tend to be controlled overwhelmingly by a few corporations which prioritize profitable processed foods which with supply chains that rely heavily on plastic packaging and long-distance transport. This model is highly energy and monoculture intensive with vast tracts of land appropriated for industrial meat production which leads to deforestation 
emissions, soil depletion, and biodiversity loss. A food justice program could ensure universal access to nutritious, regenerative, vegetarian food. Governments can fund the development of regenerative farms as well as food gardens in urban and suburban areas with produce sold at affordable prices through community hubs in every neighborhood. And we can even cut them some slack for adding the extra U to neighborhood, right? (laughs) That can double as cafeterias serving vegetarian meals. These would be convenient and attractive places for anyone to shop and eat, providing high quality foods covering all necessary nutritional needs while facilitating conviviality and community engagement. In other words, enhancing your local area community, man, making things fun, making it exciting. I I just love that. Such a system would improve health outcomes and also help to dramatically reduce use, land use, and ecological impact of the food system. Energy and water. These are essential to human survival. Energy and water should be run as public utilities with a two-tier pricing system. A quota of energy and water should be made available for free to all households, adjusted for the number of residents sufficient to meet basic needs. Additional use of energy and water beyond this quota can be charged at a progressive rate to disincentivize excess throughput, delivering yet further benefits for the environment. This approach tends to have have strong popular support. The public energy system can be used to reduce fossil fuel use on a science-based schedule and prioritize a rapid transition to renewables. While rules governing the public water system can be used to prevent over-extraction by private firms and ensure a stable and equitably allocated supply of water during droughts. Look at that. Thinking through everything, isn't he? Communications. Internet access and mobile phone data are necessary for daily life and should be treated as public utilities. A basic monthly package should be available to individuals or households for free with additional data and other services available at market rates. The public provider would be fully independent from government with cutting edge data security to preclude any state censorship. Look at that. He's even addressing the privacy stuff here, isn't he? Much like the Postal Service does not read letters it delivers, a public data network should be be designed to protect privacy. Oh, my God. Listen to this. This is where, folks, this is where it gets really good. This is where it gets really, really good. He is going to talk without saying the words modern monetary theory. He is going to talk about modern monetary theory. I want you to... Listen and really take a moment to realize what a huge deal it is that someone with Jason Hickel's stature is out there putting this stuff out there for the public. This is a guy who gets more likes and retweets of his Twitter feed than probably the entire MMT community combined. And he's putting this out there. So I want you to know what a huge deal this is. Don't just blow this off. This is important. How to pay for it. The traditional answer is that to pay for public services, you first need more GDP growth, increase corporate production of stuff we don't need, then tax the revenues from that production to fund public production of stuff we do need. This assumption is so entrenched in the public imagination that is completely taken for granted. Now, folks, when they take it for granted, they just assume that's when it's become institutionalized, right? Anyway, it's leveraged by the right to claim that public services are somehow given to us by rich people, those who pay the most taxes, which of course is quite often not even true. So we should therefore be grateful to them and do whatever it takes to let them accumulate more. It also is ecologically dangerous. We urgently need things like public transit, renewable energy to meet our climate goals. If we need more corporate growth to pay for things, it increases the total energy demand and makes decarbonization more difficult to achieve. In reality, there is, here we go. In reality, there is no reason 
that public production needs to rely on quote unquote funding from prior private production as if corporations somehow produce money, which of course they do not just, just remember this. I want you to know so many people shared Richard Wolf's crap about corporations, the United States borrowing money from corporations and they shared it like a fucking seal arping and doing circus tricks without thought at this channel we think we don't just do things unthoughtfully we don't just say things okay but there are those that don't have that same level of integrity and share that trash and then repeat it and it is trash and it has hurt us immensely because when you have a huge platform you have huge responsibility if you say wrong things in front of huge crowds you're hurting people get it right no more excuses no more passes given it's 2023 learn it's time so in reality there's no reason that public production needs to rely on funding from prior private production as if corporations somehow produce money which of course they do not here we go any government that has sufficient monetary sovereignty can mobilize public production directly simply by issuing public finance to do it. As Keynes pointed out, anything we can actually do in terms of productive capacity, we can pay for. And when it comes to productive capacity, high income economies already have far more than they need. Deploying public finance simply shifts the use of this capacity from corporations to public, where it can be used for democratically ratified social and ecological objectives rather than for capital accumulation. Look at this. Let's say this together. Deploying public finance, in other words, spending public money into the economy, simply shifts the use of this capacity from corporations to we the people where it can be used for democratically ratified social and ecological objectives rather than for making the fat rich fatter here we go the job guarantee folks what's not to love about this okay the job guarantee this same approach can be used to fund a public job guarantee. The JG would permanently end unemployment and ensure that anyone, folks, this is key. Look, the JG would permanently end unemployment and ensure that anyone who wants can train to participate in the most important collective projects of our generation, expanding renewable energy capacity, regenerating ecosystems, improving public services, care work, et cetera, urgent socially necessary production with living wages and workplace democracy. Let's stop here for just a minute. By redefining, by redefining what work is, we are able to take the power away from capital by producing socially valuable community enhancing goods and services for our friends and neighbors and other citizens and other people within our communities. We take away the power of the capitalist class. If the capitalist class wants us, they must meet or beat the price that we get from the public job guarantee okay now jason takes it a step further and this is why i stopped here the job guarantee in terms of the modern monetary theory job guarantee is the base wage it is the bottom it is the lowest tier it is the um the wage floor in other words we're getting rid of a um minimum wage and we're creating the living wage and that living wage is now the new floor all the stuff that fell below here people aren't going to work there anymore why would you work at a shit paying job when you can get one with a living wage with federal benefits why would you do it you wouldn't so the thing is is that you need to know that every lie these people tell you about what a job guarantee is 
It's a sign of integrity to not lie. And if you don't know a subject yourself inherently, you should never speak on it as if you do. In fact, you should go the extra mile to say, I don't know what this is all about. Can you explain it to me? And you should never allow someone to have an opinion before they understand because an opinion that runs rampant, and this is what these shitty alt medias do. They run around and say stupid things. They say the dumbest things. And because they have these weird sycophantic relationships where their followers just repeat it ad nauseum without thinking, we end up with the stupidest culture of all time, already dumbed down by a propaganda machine and a disinformation campaign from our government. So it's important to understand the job guarantee isn't make work. It isn't forcing people at gunpoint. It isn't some sort of coercive thing. This is literally defanging and declawing and providing a living wage that can support you with living benefits. Why don't these people repeat it the right way? Why do they lie and misrepresent it? There's something fundamentally wrong with a person that speaks about a subject that they don't understand. There's fundamentally something wrong with a person that goes and blabs about this stuff and diminishes it something like a job guarantee without having done the research. It's shameful. It's inexcusable. And quite frankly, our society should make it unforgivable at this point. There is no way in the world that people that don't understand should have an opinion on something until they do understand it. It's okay to say you don't understand. We got to re we got to reclaim it being okay to not know something. We don't always have to have some shit hot take. We can stop for a minute and become useful people and learn instead of just flapping gums about shit we don't know. We have the right and we have the responsibility to be smarter than that, to never speak past our point of understanding, but to only say, I don't know. Can you point me to more information? Can you explain this better? Can you show me? Can you help me? But to have an opinion without doing the work, I have no respect for people like that. I just don't. I have zero respect for people like that. The job guarantee, the same approach can be used to fund a public job guarantee. The JG would permanently end unemployment and ensure that anyone who wants to can train to participate in the most important collective projects of our generation. Again, this is different from MMT. MMT sets the job guarantee as the base. What Jason's suggesting is that we can make it more than that. And I don't have a problem with that either, by the way. But that's not the same thing as the MMT job guarantee. And it definitely starts bringing up political things, political issues within that space that would need to be worked out. So that's the only concern I have with making the job guarantee more than the base case for unemployment. But I'm okay with it. Just it's not doing the same thing. The JG would help reorient labor towards social and ecological use value rather than servicing corporate profit. I love this. The program would have to be financed by the government, the currency issuer, but should, God, look at that. I, I, I'm just so impressed with Jason Nichols. I wonder if he got an MMT or to, to edit this for him or not, because I am just so impressed. Now, here's what he says at the end. I'll, I, his, his comment on a basic income we're going to talk about here. But it says the program would have to be financed by the government, the currency issuer, but should be democratically managed at the appropriate level of locality to determine what forms of production are most necessary to meet community needs. Now, here's where he says something, and I'm going to explain this from my vantage point, and I'm going to say that everybody doesn't share my belief on this. But he says, and of course, a basic income should be available to anyone who cannot or who for whatever reason chooses not to. Now, here's the problem. When you start giving money away as opposed to labor, you're setting the labor standard. The labor standard is what the economy is run on with the job guarantee. Within the United States, and this is different all the way around the world, most places have a type of social security out there. But in the United States, we have something called social security. 
We also have things like unemployment and disability insurance, stuff like that. But fight uh, the, the social security handles disability. It handles survivor benefits. It handles a whole host of things for retirement. Okay. And so we already have a basic income in the United States. Now around the world, each location has its own version of this, but social security I've always maintained should be expanded and should be absolutely made available to people based on certain criteria. But I want to state for the record, if you go with the job guarantee and redefine work, much of the stuff that people that don't want to work would be able to do would be their own thing anyway. This is why I have so much of a problem with it. And I understand why people always want to throw in the basic income. Because what they're trying to do is preempt a fight. I'm ready to have that fight, okay? The importance of a job guarantee being redefining work and not just taking private sector work and turning it into a guarantee, but literally changing what we compensate. I would even go so far as to say parents, stay-at-home parents, are doing a vital public service by raising their children. Why not? Universal child care? Absolutely. But a parent that wants to stay home with their child or whatever, why wouldn't we provide a basic income for that? Why make that a make that a job guaranteed job? I mean, there's some people out there that would have a complaint about, but there's somebody that's gonna have a complaint about everything. The issue here is that I don't want my hours to be able to be subsidized by a predatory organization okay once you take away the ability for them to gouge on price based on non-productive work based on being able to take you and uberize you and suddenly you're out there driving an uber car while you're receiving your basic income this is the uberization that libertarians have fought for and what absolutely unfortunately guys like milton friedman push for okay this is why i don't agree with that because it pushes us to that uberization, that gig economy. And if you want that kind of gig economy, let me tell you, that is where precarity kicks in. That is like consulting versus full-time. That is all the bad shit out there. And the UBI or a basic income would need to be so high that you could live on it, period, without having to get a part-time job. So how do you value labor over non-labor? How do you value a person's effort and the effort they're putting in versus non-effort versus non-payback into the society, really, if you will? Because that's what the job guarantee does. It allows each of us to contribute to society, not to the man, not to capital, but to one another, to pay back each other as it was in the old days. Think about this. Before money and before all the stuff in, in primitive cultures, people worked not for trinkets and trash from the convenience aisle, but for food. They had the men hunt. They had the women gather. They had um, a host of other aspects of society that were just each other serving each other, right? Some of this is going back to the primitive. For those of you who know Soulfly, we'll do a little back to the primitive here. But I just want to make it clear, though, okay, a basic income as a means of would need to be larger, would need to be at a living wage. Otherwise, what are you doing? And I think this is where it becomes problematic because a living wage, if you don't have price anchors, can literally drive up inflation big time. And I'm not talking about the kind of inflation that helps. I'm talking about the kind of inflation that hurts, okay? So unless we had a complete redo of the Federal Reserve and the entire central banking system and the entire interest rate, I say we have zero interest rate policy forever and put controls on credit as opposed to controls on interest rates. I think that's where the, the win is. But anyway, somebody else can have a different opinion. I'm not going to fight with them on it. Let's get back to the article. He says, uh, and of course, a basic income should be available to anyone who cannot work or who, for whatever reason, chooses not to. This idea proves wildly popular in polls, and the additional power of the job guarantee is that it can be used to set standards. This is it. It can be used to set standards for wages and working time. 
shortening the work week to say 32 hours. What if, what if the job guarantee was only a 32 hour work week? What if it was only four days a week? What if it was only 25 hours a week? Who knows? I mean, the point is, is that we can change it any way we want. That's the beauty of it. And then the outside world has to kind of catch up because you set the standard. That's competition, folks. They don't like to hear that, but that is a good one. And workplace democracy across the whole economy as private firms would come under pressure to adopt similar standards to the JG or otherwise risk losing staff. Because if people can opt to do dignified, socially important work in a democratic workplace, then why would they agree to do meaningless labor under worse conditions for corporate firms whose primary goal is just to accumulate capital? They wouldn't. The power of universal public services is that we can improve people's access to goods necessary for decent living with provisioning systems that require less aggregate energy and material use and which allow us to accelerate decarbonization. These outcomes can be further enhanced by ensuring strong democratic governance of public systems. Together with the job guarantee, economic security is permanently abolished. I want to stop here for a second because I just had an epiphany of my own. If all the basic needs are taken care of by the currency issuing government, then all that's left over is kind of like your elective credits in college, right? It's it's like the nice to haves. It's the fun stuff. It's the whatever you'd like to, to have, okay? And so maybe the basic income doesn't need to be as high. Maybe the guy working, you know, a job in the community um, gets everything they need. And maybe that's a decision folks make. I, I think that's not the worst thing ever. Hmm. Thinking it through. Interesting because the basic needs are taken care of because universal basic services. All right. I'm starting to feel something here. All right. Power of universal public services is that we can improve people's access to goods necessary for decent living with provisioning systems that require less aggregate energy and material use and which allow us to accelerate decarbonization. These outcomes can be further enhanced by ensuring strong democratic governance of public systems. Together with the job guarantee, economic insecurity is permanently abolished. This is beautiful. Economic insecurity is permanently abolished. This is not pie in the sky. It's abolished. Accomplishing a goal that growth alone has never been able to achieve and human well-being is delinked from the requirement of an ever-increasing aggregate production. This would change the political landscape, freeing us to pursue necessary climate action without any risk to employment and livelihoods, excuse me, while improving social outcomes, reducing inequality, and facilitating a shift toward a more and just ecological economy. These policies should be core demands of a united climate and labor movement. Universal services, a job guarantee, living wages, a shorter working week. These are popular interventions that could provide the basis for mass political support. For the labor movement, we need to stop pretending that the capitalist growth will magically end unemployment ensure living wages and bring workplace democracy, which it never does. And instead of fighting to achieve these objectives directly and for the climate movement, which is often accused of ignoring the material conditions of working class communities, this approach addresses real bread and butter issues, needs, and creates cause for alliances with working class formations. This is the political movement that we need. All right, folks, when I read stuff like that, I get like a burst of hope, I get a burst of energy. I get a real burst of visionary, like creativity. I start thinking about what could possibly be. And this is the stuff that motivates me because I don't really care about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Unfortunately, you see folks not talking about a positive vision of what we could do. They're not building the case for what we could do. Instead, they want to focus on how all these 
corporate owned establishment stooges are failing us. Instead of painting this positive idea and spreading it around like wildfire. So everyone begins to get on board and starts thinking, Hey, maybe this is possible, right? Instead of getting people to believe they're busy trying to show people they're stupid and why they vote Democrat or why they do this or why they do that. I mean, Let's be fair. You're not going to vote your way to any of this because the Democratic Party is absolutely captured. It's a private corporation fought successfully in U.S. federal court that they don't even have to run a primary if they don't want to. They can select whoever they want to be their candidate. They can do whatever they want, and they don't have any responsibility whatsoever to take your donations that you make to a pub, uh, candidate during one of these elections and actually you know, do anything about it. They can keep that money for the party. They can do whatever they like. I want you to understand that this isn't a a critique of the Democratic Party per se, so much as it is just telling you, stop putting your hope in places where they don't have to do anything you say. That's you know, none of you liked Kamala Harris. I doubt any of you liked Joe Biden. I bet you most of you were willing to vote for Bernie Sanders, even if you didn't think he was left enough. But Bernie Sanders didn't even make it to the nomination. Joe Biden, who could barely tie sentences together, was still stuttering and hiding out in the dark. When the primaries were even going on, Bernie Sanders was taking it over by storm. And they decided the establishment cracked down and established. Now it's going to be Biden and Biden's going to pull Harris in. There's no way you can tell me you have a democracy. You didn't vote for that shit. And if you did vote for it in the main Whatever, man, we can't all do the right thing all the time, right? But the bottom line is, is that ultimately Joe Biden ain't somebody that most people would want. He's just simply not. There's no way that that's possible. And so there's no way you can legitimately tell me, even if you had a third party or a fourth party or a 12th party, that the way this democratic system, fake democratic system works, is going to yield the kind of results you think it would need. And even if you did somehow or another squeak a few through the door, how are they going to govern within a pluralistic environment where those people are bought and paid for by corporate interests? It's very important to understand where the limitations lie so we can put our efforts toward things that will bear fruit. All right, in any event, I want you all to know that modern monetary theory and ecological justice go together. MMT and, you know, democratically run workplaces go together. MMT and universal basic services go together. MMT is a public utility. It's demonstrating the power of fiat. It's talking about the way money works and it's talking about where it originates. And when you understand that it doesn't originate from rich people and you understand that it doesn't originate from corporations and you understand that banks only exist because states give them charters and give them power to run. When you understand that, you stop saying the most worthless things. Okay. I don't want to get into petrodollar stuff because it's stupid, but suffice it to say fellow travelers are out there hyping up petrodollar. What if the end of the world reserve currency? Why don't they ever explain what would happen? Japan has a very tiny reserve currency, but Japan runs 300 to one debt to GDP ratio. How is it possible they have 300% debt to GDP, yet they run a very, very healthy, vibrant economy? They're an island nation. The same thing with the UK, the same thing with Australia, the same thing with China and Russia. Why don't they explain that these groups have health care and they have everything else and they don't have a world reserve currency like the US? Why don't they say that stuff? See, The hype around this world reserve currency is really about the U.S. extracting goods and services from around the world. It has nothing to do with the U.S.'s ability to survive and thrive. Again, I don't want our country to fail. I want this neoliberal power structure and the capitalist class to fail. But I don't want this country to fail. 
You know, I want it to be vibrant. I want it to be a place that I'm proud of again. But proud for real, not because of propaganda. Proud because what we do is the right thing. So anyway, Saturday, tomorrow, we have Bill Black joining the Macro and Cheese podcast. Bill Black is going to be talking about a regulatory environment for banks and understanding that it takes courage to absolutely crack down on corruption. It's not just money. You can have tons of money in there. What it comes down to is with same with politicians. If you're not willing to be a one-term politician, if you're not willing to sell yourself out for the right things to end corruption, you have no business being in these positions. That's what we need. We need the courage. We need the conviction. And Bill Black explains it as one of the biggest whistleblowers of all time. And with that, with that, I hope that you guys will check out the Rogue Scholar on podcast. If you don't want to see my mug shot, you can get Rogue Scholar on Spotify, Amazon, and whatever. You get it on all the podcast platforms. So go check out the Rogue Scholar as well. You're listening to it here. By all means, share the audio version so people can just binge it, okay? Anyway, without further ado, I bid you adieu, and I am, yeah, I'm out of here. Yeah.